Hello everybody and welcome to Singularity One on One. -on -one. This is a feature of singularityweblog.com where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. Today my guest on the show is Ben Gerzo. Ben has so many titles, positions and responsibilities that I will actually have to read all of those from a piece of paper so if you can bear with me for 30 seconds so that we don't miss anything from his uh, distinguished biography. Um, so Dr. Ben Gerzo is CEO of AI software company Novamente and bioinformatics company Biomind, chief technology officer of biopharma firm Genesiant Corporation, leader of the open source OpenCog AI software project, chairman of Humanity Plus, advisor to the Singularity University and Singularity Institute, research professor in the Fujian Key Lab for Brain-like Intelligence Systems at Xiamen University, China, and general chair of the Artificial General Intelligence Conference Series. His research work encompasses artificial general intelligence, natural language processing, cognitive science, data mining, machine learning, computational, computational finance, bioinformatics, virtual worlds, and gaming in other areas. He has published a dozen scientific books nearly 90 technical papers and numerous journalistic articles. Before entering the software industry, he served as a university faculty in several departments of mathematics, computer science and cognitive science in the US, Australia and New Zealand. He has three children and too many pets to count and his spare time enjoys creating avant-garde fiction and music and the outdoors. Wow, if that's not a, an amazing biography, I don't know what is. So, Ben, welcome to Singularity 101. Oh, thanks for having me. Excellent. Let's not waste any time and jump straight into the questions. Um, would you share with us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in computer science and especially developing artificial general intelligence? Sure. I was interested in far future ideas from early youth, from reading science fiction novels primarily. From as early as I can remember, I started reading at age two and probably by three or four I was reading SF about superhuman AIs and space travel and time machines and robots, alternate dimensions, all, all the good stuff. And, you know, I always hoped that I would live long enough to see this stuff come to reality. But at this time in the, in the early 1970s, uh, it didn't necessarily seem feasible that these things could happen in, in my own lifetime. And I actually had the idea to build a spaceship and travel at faster than light speed <laughs> so that exploiting relativistic time dilation, I could then come back, say, a million years in the future when all this awesome stuff would have happened. So it's, it's a source of great delight to me that it now appears plausible. I, I can see the stuff like within decades rather than having to go away into space and, and come back to the Earth of a million years later. In terms of my specific research focus now on, on AI, both with a view toward building superhuman thinking machines and with a view toward using AI to cure longevity. <clears throat> Let me re-say that. <laughs> but both, both with a view toward making human level and superhuman thinking machines and with a view toward using AI to ensure longevity and cure disease and help us all live forever. I really focused on these things in my late 20s. I mean, I, I was interested in all sorts of things, ranging from unified physics to nanotechnology to AI, bioscience, uh, pure mathematical modeling of the mind. I was even interested in, in sort of uh, Zen Buddhism and in, in composing music that could, could help... Uh, enlighten people's minds by sort of triggering the right neural responses. I so, mean, and, you know, so I, I came to the conclusion at a certain point in my life that I would have to focus on one thing if I was going to do something great. Uh -huh. And when I, enumer when I enumerated 
all the possibilities. I was really drawn to AI. It had always been one of my main interests. But it occurred to me at a certain point, you know, time travel could be possible by, say, twisting a star into the right shape to make it a naked singularity, which is elongated rather than a point. Or, say, nanotechnology could be possible if you made machines to build smaller machines to build smaller machines to build smaller machines to build smaller machines. You know, life extension could be possible if you build the right drugs. Uploading a human mind into a computer could be possible if you build the right brain scanning equipment. But all these things require a lot of engineering and a lot of people and a lot of money. AI, you know, quite possibly all you got to do is type the right program code into computers that we have right now. And you have a superhuman thinking machine. And this was sort of marginal when I first really, really seriously started working on, on AI in the, the early 90s. Now computers are so much more powerful. I, I really think that's it's quite definitively true. Like if if way less than Google's computing resources were devoted to making a thinking machine, then you know, I, I think we could have a vastly superhuman and hopefully beneficial intelligence. It's just typing the right code. Just a problem of understanding what to do, and that, that's what's so appealing about it. So, speaking of typing the right, the right code, then, uh, th it does seem that, in your opinion, AI would be a matter of software rather than hardware, because you already said that, in terms of hardware, way less than Google's hardware <laughs> capabilities would probably be sufficient if you have the, the right software. Is that the case? I think so. 50 years ago, AI was a matter of hardware and software, mm -hmm. and the computer hardware industry has made incredible advances, not because of AI, but because of people trying to make computers to serve other purposes. And now, I think, due to the amazing work of so many engineers building better and better hardware, now we're at the position where AI basically comes down to, to a software problem. This is not to say that better hardware wouldn't help. I mean, the, the whole von Neumann computer architecture, which underlies our current computers, mm -hmm. is not really optimal for artificial general intelligence. I, I really like uh, massively parallel architectures, yeah, like the connection machine. Yeah. But, I mean... You know, Don't we're getting at the same thing many in a different. Times more parallel processing power than what we are capable of producing right now. I mean, uh, no. million times more. Ab ab absolutely not. No. It's a it's a naive misconception. Mm -hmm. the, the the point is that current chips are just massively faster than, than a neuron. I mean, we have many many neurons, but each of them operates many orders of magnitude slower than than a computer chip. So. We can do just as much processing or, or more with a distributed network of processors. So you make but up with speed for the lack of parallelism. You can make up with speed for the lack of parallelism. However, it makes life complicated because it means you need to use a different architecture. Yeah. And this comes down to one of my differences with Ray Kurzweil and the whole school of thought that the best way to achieve human-level human AGI brain. is going to be by emulating the human brain. Yeah. I mean, yes, absolutely, 100%, that can work. However, the hardware infrastructure that we have now is far from ideally suited for emulating the human brain in, in depth because the human brain is a massively parallel analog or quantum computing system, whereas the digital computers that we have are distributed networks of very fast processors mm -hmm. which are classical digital computers. Mm -hmm. it, it's a different kind of computing fabric, which means that just emulating the human brain, of course it's going to work, but it's going to require more processing power than building an equivalently or more greatly intelligent system, which is more appropriately tailored for the hardware infrastructure at hand. 
So in that sense, if you are sort of disconnecting the uh, in invention of AI from the simulation of, uh, of, from the mapping and the complete simulation of the human brain, then that could happen potentially earlier or later, uh, but not necessarily connected to that point in time. That's right. Can it I happen think earlier? It can in happen tomorrow. Case? Yeah. Tomorrow. No, probably not. <laughs> it could have happened. It could have happened last year, and nobody told us about it. I mean, yes, I, I think the two achievements of mapping and simulating the human brain mm -hmm. versus creating human level or greater than human level AGI, I think these two achievements need not be closely synchronized with each other. Now, they, they may in fact be closely synchronized with each other. I'm not saying there is no relation yeah. between them, but it's not a necessary relation. Yeah. And I, I think that if either adequate funding, adequate volunteer manpower, or adequate good luck is achieved by some AGI project in the near future, then I think we will achieve human-level AGI through non-brain simulation-based means mm -hmm. before the human brain is mapped. Well, let me stop you there on the adequate funding uh, thought. Uh, I was reading your uh, article, How Long Until Human Level AI? Results from an Expert, expert Assessment. And one of the surprising uh, conclusions or results that, that you have there is that overall experts, and that's a quote, Experts are skeptical about the impact of massive research funding, especially if it is concentrated in relatively few approaches. So, yeah. are you in, in contradiction to the overall expert opinion here, or do, do you fall within that? Because you just said that given I do, funding, I... we would expect uh, results, whereas it, this seems to suggest that I mean, what is adequate funding? Do we have adequate funding right now? Right now, the field of AGI research is funded very poorly hmm. as, as compared, for example, to medical research, uh, research on breast cancer or heart disease. I see. As compared to research on particle physics, in which they'll spend $100 billion on the giant accelerator yeah as, as as compared to many other aspects of science and engineering research mm -hmm. even as compared to some other fairly wacky stuff like nanotechnology research although there you have to look and in many cases the most forward-looking aspects of those branches of research aren't being well funded either for instance loads of money for heart disease and breast cancer but the NIH will not fund much research specifically on life extension. Mm -hmm. Nanotechnology, plenty of research on nanofabrics and lubricants, yeah. not much research on Drexlerian molecular assemblers. And in AI, the situation is even worse because the total pool of funding on AI isn't all that big. And then AGI, the quest to build artificial general intelligence that can think with the generality and scope that people can, I mean, that's a, that's a tiny sliver of a small amount of AI funding. Now, the survey that you're talking about, the question that we asked regarding massive funding was, what would happen if $100 billion was yeah. put into to AI funding? On the other hand, for my own AI project, what I would like is something like $5 million a year for, say, five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. and there's a big gap between those two numbers. 